eyes, wow, there's a lot of eyes. <laughs> Um, before I start, I just want to say thank you, Samsung, for bringing like, all the creators here. It's the first time I've been around so many like-minded people, so big shout out to you guys. <laughs> I hope that you guys are having fun. I hope that you guys have met new friends, and um, I hope that you guys learn things from all the amazing speakers that came before me. It's a tough act to follow. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Um, also, thanks for letting me stand here because I am extremely nervous. I am not a public speaker whatsoever. And so, you know, it's, it's getting to me a little bit. But I'm going to try to turn my nervousness into excitement because a lot of people tell me it's the same feeling. So let me just, <laughs> let me just get that. Um, you know, actually, what would help me? <laughs> <laughs> what would actually help me a lot is if Everyone one time could just be like, let's go. Like just one time, really loud. Please. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. That, that literally made me feel a lot better. <laughs> okay, so my name is Marilyn Hugh, and I was born and raised in California. Um, and I'm all those things that they said before I came up here. Long story short, I started doing photography like a long, long time ago. And I feel like people skipped over all that and thought I was just popping overnight. That is totally not true. <laughs> when I was young, a little tiny photography seed was planted and you know that eventually grew into my lifelong pursuit of trying to become a photographer, like professionally. You know, just turning my passion into a career. And um, I'm nowhere where I want to be in life yet, but I promise you guys I'm working on it. <laughs> um, yeah, so brands usually commission me to shoot lifestyle stuff, and um, artists and models also hire me to shoot their portraits, but I feel like my favorite style of photography is conceptual photography. Um, I feel that photography is probably one of the most uh, powerful and um, important storytelling tools you know, it allows all of us to share all of our different perspectives from all walks of life. And it's even crazy because if you don't speak the same language, you, you could still understand what the image means. And, um, you know, in a way, I, I see that as like a poetic universal language. <laughs> so today, I'm going to be talking about how I got into photography, uh, what inspires me to create, and my time on exposure. And um, I also want to end the whole show with telling you guys what I think, uh, you know, makes a good photo a really great one. And I promise you, this is not a rug. This is real and actual advice. <laughs> okay, so this is my short story, a lot longer. And I hope you're not bored yet because I have a lot of time, <laughs> like 40 minutes, I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, so like many Vietnamese people back in the 80s and 90s, my parents was trying to escape a communist country. They don't want to live there. My dad was tired of it and said, you know what, we got to go. Um, so he moved our entire family to the US and started over. Um, my parents are such strong people. Like they, they went through a lot of adversity. They had to learn a new language. They had to move across the entire world. And somehow they became successful entrepreneurs. So shout out to them. <laughs> They like did a lot and sacrificed everything just so that my brothers and sisters can come over here and have a good life. I'm so lucky that I was born here in the States um, because I never had to go through any of those hardships. You know, I think my dad coming over here successfully was his big I made it moment. And um, you know, he, he did nails for 13 years and so he saved up tips and bought his equipment, his first set of equipment. He had one of those like giant VHS cameras, and he also bought a really cool 35 millimeter Minolta camera, and um, would shoot and document his new life. Uh, when I got a little older, I was looking through our photo albums, and I realized he's not in a lot of these pictures. Kind of like most photographers, we're not in any of these pictures. So I was like, you know what? I kind of want to learn how to shoot photos too, just so that my dad could be in some of these pictures. Uh, of course, though, my dad's the type of Asian <laughs> that keeps the factory plastic on everything <laughs> until it falls off. I'm pretty sure he still has that yellow sticker on the corner of his 10-year-old TV, like today. So basically what I'm trying to say is he's not going to let me use his camera. Um, <laughs> he bought me little disposable cameras instead, and I took pictures at school every day, just random pictures. I was also inspired to, to document my own life. And you know, as you can see, 
I was into selfies and shoe pics way before it was cool. <laughs> uh, the class, or actually fast forward to my junior year in high school, I decided to take a photography class um, as an elective. And in that class, it taught me about basics of photography and developing in the Lightroom. Um, my teacher's name was Mr. Hopkins. And he would give us themes or creative briefs to go out and shoot whatever the brief was. He also had a critique day. And if you got an A plus on critique day, your photo would make the gallery wall, which was like a big thing. And um, it would stay up there until the next time we had critique day. So our first assignment for that class was um, kind of like an assessment test. And I begged my dad, I'm like, please let me use your camera, please, please, please. And uh, you know, the reason why I wanted to use his camera is because I was trying to flex that I could do more than just use a point and shoot camera. Um, so he's like, you know what, I'm gonna teach you the basics, let you have at it. Pretty sick, my dad let me have his camera because I actually still have it today. Um, so mm, I had a friend named Rowdy and he was like a little superstar at our school and I asked him to model for me for that, for that project. I would like describe to him scenes and I would describe to him emotions and just have him act it out. And I was like shooting away. Uh, at one point during our shoot, it started to rain. And I thought that was like the most magical moment, you know, like looking through the viewfinder, it felt like a movie. And every time I clicked that shutter, I felt like I fell more in love with photography. Um, so yeah, like super excited about that. We finished and wrapped up our shoot. And the next day I was like really excited to go develop the film. I was so proud that I memorized how to take the film out, put it in the reel, basically with my eyes closed. And um, I was just waiting for that big reveal. You know, everyone loves the dark room because it feels very intimate and you can, you know, see the pictures actually come to life. So I pulled out my contact sheet and I put it on top of, uh, you know, the little light box thing. And I shot something that I never thought that I would. Basically, I shot a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> uh, I was looking at a bunch of black rectangles on my contact sheet. Pretty disappointed because I did a huge rookie mistake. I used a 200 ISO film. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but that just means that it's, uh, you need a lot of light to use that. And um, I was shooting at night. I didn't have flash and it was stupid. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have done that. I was embarrassed that I didn't turn anything in that, that time. And I was also pretty sad that I didn't have those photos because a couple years later, my friend passed away. So it was a lesson that I learned, and I promise you I never repeated that. <laughs> and since then, I was like super obsessed with getting on that wall. Like I wanted to push myself to just do better each and every time. And at the end of the school year, my teacher, Mr. Hopkins, submitted my portfolio to the LA County Fair. Um, I was competing against other students from all different high schools in my county, and I was actually surprised that I won first place in best portfolio. So that moment made me realize that maybe I might have an eye for this, and if I practice and continue to get better, I could possibly make this a career one day. But I was down to test it out right then and there. <laughs> So 16-year-old me um, saved up for a digital camera, one of those power shot cameras. And I started asking people at school, um, do you need prom photos, graduation photos? Shoot, I'll even shoot your MySpace photos, OK? <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, my sister was in college. She was taking a graphic design class. So when she wasn't home, I would pull up her laptop and just try to learn Photoshop myself. I used like every effects filter you could think of. <laughs> And I thought it was so cool back then, but looking at some of the photos now, maybe it was a little bit too much. Um, but still, people were down to pay me. They paid me like 50 bucks for like a two hour session. And I genuinely think that's where the hustle began. Um, so yeah, like most immigrant parents, you know, they, they wanted me to have a life that they never had. And uh, they wanted me to get a stable job. They wanted me to go to college, you know get 401k, meet somebody, have kids before I was 30. And the problem was I was never that great at school. <laughs> I actually photoshopped my grades to make them look good. <laughs> and um, you know, I knew that I would have to take a lot of risks to get where I am today. And probably risk I wouldn't take if I had kids, honestly. So yeah, my dad was a photographer and he loved it, but he had no idea how I was gonna make a living off of this. And it was also hard for me to reassure him because I didn't really know. 
I just knew that, um, you know, if I took little steps that I could get a little bit closer to where I wanted to be. And this may sound kind of arrogant and cocky, but at the time, I was living an average life knowing damn well I was not an average person. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so I guess having good work ethic meant that, you know, no job was like too small or too big for me. I, I really wanted to try my best like with any job that I ever had because I felt like whatever I did, I could probably learn at least one or two things and apply it to the next thing. So I had multiple retail jobs and I even did a two year internship for free, unpaid. You know, I wanted to show that unpaid internship how valuable I was. At one point they were just like, hey, we don't have enough money to pay you, but I didn't care. I stayed every single day. I wanted to show them how valuable I was. I like, I, I basically worked and did all these things they didn't ask me to do just so that if I'm not there one day, they could feel my absence, you know? And that totally worked because they eventually hired me full time and I became lead creative. Moving on from that, I worked at another streetwear company and I started shooting editorials and I made a lot of graphic t-shirts. And then um, from there, I met a DJ named Skrillex in 2015. So I worked as his merch director and um, I produced his pop-ups all over the world alongside his tour. And after the pop-ups were over, I would come out to a show and just shoot. Shoot for fun, you know? And uh, he never used any of the photos, but eventually he saw them and he's like, hey, this, these are kind of dope. So he trusted me enough to do it full time. <laughs> so I eventually became his tour photographer and, um, you know, and his, cre his main creative for his brand for the past six years. Fully immersed in the music industry, doing all that I did, my parents still did not believe that like I would be doing this, you know? They, they felt like all these opportunities were kind of temporary and that eventually, you know, without traditional education, I would hit a wall and not understand what to do next. And to be honest, I did hit a lot of walls, but I found a way around it. And I always wanted to, you know, show my parents that there's more than one way to succeed. Um, even if I wanted to quit, honestly, I don't know what else I would do. I feel like art and photography is the only thing that I'm pretty good at. So, you know, in between all this work stuff, um, I had to, you know, maintain a balance to, to create for fun. And there have been times where I actually fell out of love with photography because I felt super burnt out. You know, I was like pumping out work and content for other people. And when you treat your art like a factory, it does start to weigh on you a lot and just constantly doing stuff that other people tell you to do. So I tried really hard to carve out time, you know, to do stuff for myself. Creating art for myself kind of also helped me unlock another side of my creativity. Um, most of my personal art, I feel, is inspired by self-reflection. So I treat my personal photography like I do a journal. And when I look back at some of these photos, you know, I can tell and remember all the different epiphanies that I've had in my life and all different stages of my life. Um, and it usually starts with me feeling extremely bored. <laughs> Seriously, one of my creative processes is letting myself be so bored that my mind just kind of wanders and does its own thing. <laughs> For example, you know, when I'm taking a long shower, I'll think of all these arguments that I never had, but how to win them, you know, all these comebacks. <laughs> or uh, like sitting in traffic. You guys ever feel like you think more deeply when you're alone in your car and you're just driving, listening to music? So that's where I get a lot of my ideas and I have time to reflect. Um, and you know, like most thoughts, they come very fragmented. But when they feel complete, I'll try to write them down. And I'll write down a bunch of them. And um, I'll sketch them out, like the good ones. And uh, the ones that are more complex, I'll make mood boards for. And when I feel like it's a pretty solid idea, I'll share that with the right model. I'll cast somebody. And, and I want to find the right team to help me execute. I honestly love curating teams. I love styling. I love set design, <laughs> but most of all, I really like connecting with people on an artistic level. And um, I started sharing my photos on Instagram back in like 2014. And I was actually able to reach so many people with my art that that really inspired me to continue telling my story and just continue creating in general. Many of you, if not pretty much all of you, <laughs> could probably agree that when you are doing a creative project that's your idea, with your friends, 
and you don't have pressures from clients or deadlines, it's probably the greatest feeling of all time. You know, like the biggest high for me, I think, is when I look at a final image and it's exactly like how I pic pictured it in my head. Exposure uh, was the first time I ever created personal art without any of the perks I just mentioned above. <laughs> so for those of you looking at me like, what is exposure? Um, well, it's a competition series that was aired on Hulu where eight photographers, some of them are in here actually, <laughs> Uh, where we would go in on a level playing field and we would test um, all aspects of mobile photography. One winner would walk out with a contract that could change their life. And I'm going to show you guys a trailer because it's probably going to explain the show a lot better than I can. So I'm going to step aside here. Shoot. We searched the country to find eight up and coming photographers to compete in some mind blowing challenges. The last photographer standing will go home with a $250,000 photography contract from Samsung. A quarter million dollars? Do you know what I could do with a quarter million dollars? I got this. This would go viral on Twitter. This would do numbers on Instagram. I wanted to take a risk. Cool photo, but what is going on? It's making me feel really ashamed. If it was up to me, I'd have a lighter and just burn it and scan it, but I don't think I was allowed to light anything on fire. <laughs> <laughs> there was blood, sweat, and tears in this, literally. Wow, you brought the humor again. My game plan is just to make it seem like I'm horrible, and the real challenge will come through and take first place. So you took two photos in total? Yeah. You always want to take more than two photos. Yeah. I doubted myself and I forgot who I was as an artist. I was trying to be something that I wasn't. I guess I'm not the best under pressure. I just want to prove that I actually deserve to be here. I don't think the execution paid off. This is the worst I've felt. I'm just second guessing myself. I am here to prove that I can be a mom and a photographer. The American dream is not a house and a car. It's to be able to do what I love and make a living doing it. And this is my shot. <laughs> Shout out to Michelle, Monroe, and Jose. They were also on the show, and they're sitting in the audience with us. Um, honestly, watching that gave me goosebumps and a lot of butterflies. At one point, actually, I was hesitant to go on the show. I had a lot of work obligations that I felt like I needed to stay back and finish. And um, you know, I felt pressured into to staying back. But like I said earlier, I think that balance is important, right? So there was no way I was going to pass up on this opportunity. And I dropped everything just to go do exposure. Good thing I did, though, because I would have sold myself pretty short, I think. <laughs> Um, so on exposure, we worked independently. We were a one-man team. Some challenges, we were also the model, too. I didn't have days to plan and shoot and edit. I literally had minutes. And um, you know, if you wanted to stay in the competition, you did have to win the judges' approvals. Obviously, I only wanted to show them photos I liked, but you had to turn in something, even if you didn't like it. Um, that really hurt my creative ego, knowing that some pieces I turned in were pretty trash. <laughs> I think the best example of this um, is when they challenged us to do a forced perspective challenge. The brief was to go to a prop wall. We had five minutes. And we had to fight with all the other photographers to grab whatever it is and uh, run across the street and shoot a forced perspective photo. All that means is that whatever object you grab it had to be small. It had to appear smaller or bigger than what it actually was. Think about people like shooting photos next to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. They're all like, you know. <laughs> So the items I grabbed was a mini basket, a balloon, some plastic flowers, and a glass lantern. My genius idea was to tape the balloon and the mini basket and made it look like someone was standing in the fart, like standing inside of it, and um, you know, have them look like they're floating away. Well, I wasted like 90% of my time just trying to tape it. <laughs> And I felt extra rushed because my muse, Jose, over there only let me have two minutes to shoot. And I mean, that was understandable, though, because he had his own stuff to shoot, too. Um, but the wind was going off that day. My, my balloon was like falling off, and I just had to like 
move on to the next thing. I was so frustrated. I took my scissors and just stabbed the balloon and like was like, all right, whatever. I'm going to do something else. So my next idea was pretty frantic too. I had like a glass lantern and I was like trying to pretend that I was inside the gl glass lantern, but it didn't work out. There was so much glare on the glass that it was like no point in even trying that. Um, so I gave on that too. I gave up on that too. It was not a good idea. So I had to pivot one last time and I stuck a flower into the ground, the plastic flower. And my idea was to like kind of pose in the background like this. It made it look like I was like climbing up the flower. <laughs> I was only able to get two shots before they called time. And to be honest with you guys, I think only one of them came out okay. Uh, I was like pretty sad about that. And everybody else was talking about how great their photo was and how excited they were to edit their photos. I didn't see what they did, but it made me super insecure about my own work. Um, everybody ran to their workstations, and I pretty much walked like this, because I knew I had nothing to edit, and I had nothing to really go through. I basically decided that I'm going to choose the last photo, put a filter on it, turn it in, and take a nap like the rest of the time. <laughs> but come judgment time, my photo actually wasn't so bad. I, I made like a uh, top two, I think, for that challenge. And the whole situation was just way worse in my head because I'd lost confidence in myself just for a little bit. I was stressing myself out for no reason. I was basically getting in my own way. So I know that if I didn't shake off imposter syndrome that I was not gonna make it, not gonna make it to the end. Exposure was all about performing under pressure and problem solving. Um, it was designed to push us uh, to our limits, but also gave us a chance to see how well we would adapt. And um, we went from shooting album covers to food to even using Photoshop and <laughs> creating surreal art. Um, they covered a lot of types of photography, and they were looking for a through line in each photographer. My goal was for the judges to recognize that it was my photo without me ever saying that it was mine. And um, I, the best way I felt like I could do that was just to share my own unique perspective. I wanted them to see things from my eyes, literally and metaphorically. All of us use the S21. We all share the same resources. We even shot the same subjects sometimes. So literally, the only thing that would make us different was our unique individual perspective and our eyes. <laughs> so for the finale, the judges said, you can shoot your dream photo. We had creative freedom to do whatever we wanted, to, and they would help us produce the shoot. And the judges wanted us to explain our concept before we showed them our photo. And then once they saw it, they would see how clear that message came through um, in, in the picture. I knew exactly what I wanted to shoot, because like I said before, I wrote down a lot of ideas throughout my whole life. So I chose um, this piece. And uh, I, I chose this piece because I felt like it highlighted a really important time in my life. And um, it, win or lose, it was going to be the perfect last message. So this piece was about the old me, and it's called uh, In Case of Loneliness. So it was about how every time I felt lonely, I would default to a lot of vices and problems. I mean, uh, a lot of vices and distractions to run away from my problems. And it did help me forget about things in short term. But at the same time, I felt like it was leading me in the wrong direction in life. Um, so I knew I had to break that cycle to grow. And I refocused all of my energy into my career and the more I accomplished, the more confident I became in myself. Eventually, I didn't rely on those vices anymore to be happy because I was just a different person. Elimination day felt like a day in high school in Mr. Hopkins' class, you know, but on steroids. Like, I wasn't trying to get on the wall. I was literally trying to win a quarter million dollars, um, a contract with Samsung. So. <laughs> After presenting my piece, I was so nervous. Definitely more nervous than I am right now, actually. <laughs> um, I'll never forget just standing there and uh, sweating like crazy. Like every pause felt like it was hours long. And there was not really much I could do besides wait for them to announce a winner. So as soon as they called my name, I immediately started crying. <laughs> I think I even blacked out for a moment. And I had to pinch myself because I wasn't sure if it was all real. Everybody was all hugging me, congratulating me. And the only thing I could think about was that this whole thing was recorded. <laughs> and um, my parents would finally see how passionate I was about photography and that I could actually do this. My life changed so much after the show. I, you know, my parents became incredibly proud of me. 
They actually still watch the show every day till, on repeat today. This happened a year ago. <laughs> so I'm just like kind of embarrassed about it. But it's cool. It's cool that they're really proud of me. Um, I came back bolder and stronger, more confident in my own work. And I even let some of my guard down to like fall in love the right way. And I felt like one of the biggest epiphanies I had, though, on the show was that you didn't need much to create a great photo. I used to think that without expensive cameras, um, crazy lighting equipment, uh, top of the line stuff, like it would be really hard to make something amazing. But at the end of the day, art is subjective. And I think what adds the wow factor to photos is your ability to connect with the person looking at it. So don't get me wrong, awesome equipment does make good photos. But I, think if, uh, but I think to create a great photo, it requires you. And it requires your unique perspective. Technical is one half, but the better half is you. I truly believe that when you create with intention um, and you're able to inspire an idea or a feeling in someone, that's what makes a great photo. So I talked a lot about self-reflection today <laughs> and how I use that to inspire my art. So I really want to invite each of you to think about a reflection photo to share with the world. Whether that's literally a reflection, like this one or these, or maybe it's a self-reflection. I, I want you to take one step and just shoot with intention. You know, Go one step further, even, and, um, and try to connect with your audience. I think when you elaborate on your cop uh, in your caption and uh, speak with honesty, it's it's going to connect in a whole different way. Uh, I know it's difficult to be vulnerable sometimes, but I promise you, just try it. <laughs> Others feel the same way, um, will definitely resonate with you and resonate with your art a lot more. So just give them a chance to get to know you as a person. And let your photo and story take your art to the next level. I want to challenge everyone to be more than just a creator. I want you to be a storyteller. And you'll be surprised at how much deeper you'll be able to connect with your audience. Um, I guess <laughs> with all that being said, you know, I appreciate everyone listening to me and my story. And I'm happy to answer questions about the challenge, maybe. <laughs> but thanks. <laughs>